Good morning, church. How are we doing today? I'm sorry for putting that long. I heard some greats. I like that. Can we get more of that? I'm doing great. Not just good. I'm doing great. It is truly great to be with you guys this morning. Um, I got to say, I love you all. I echo the sentiments that uh, Wit shared uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, doing church with you guys even outside of the assembly on Sundays is one of the most beautiful things that we experience in life. Um, a few weeks ago, we talked about sometimes the more ugly moments that happen uh, in church. And I just wanna give you an update on how that is going. Um, a few weeks ago, we talked about murmuring in the church and complaining in the church. And I said some words that I thought might get me into trouble, but maybe they'll back away. I said, if you have to murmur about me, I want you to murmur directly to me. And that went to some of y'all's hearts. <laughs> and uh, so, so much so that um, not even just talking to me, but my inbox on my, on my phone and my texts and my inbox and my email has been filled with a uh, pretty scandalous and direct murmur. And um, I'm not gonna tell you how many of you, but just know that you're not the only one. If you sent this to me, do we have, we have a picture? I'm, I'm gonna put it up. This is what got sent to me the last two weeks. Again. <laughs> And again, and again, yeah, y'all think you're slick, I know. So you know who you are, and you're responsible for what's about to happen to you today. Because we gotta get through all of Acts chapter seven, <laughs> and a little bit of chapter eight as well. And whether this is just going to be a sermon that didn't feel as long as it actually was or a hostage situation, that's up to the murmurers among you. So make sure you hug one another and remain as thankful for one another as you were during communion today. <laughs> but we've been studying the New Testament church and the book of Acts, and uh, there's a thing that we've been seeing that's becoming a pattern. It's an uncomfortable pattern. It's kind of the story underneath of the story, as it were, that is happening for the New Testament church. And we miss it if we're not careful. And it's just kind of woven into the narrative. It keeps announcing itself again and again and again. And it's extremely subversive because it's a thing that happens and it creates the opposite result of what we expect to happen when the New Testament church encounters this because it's often the opposite thing that happens when we encounter it. And that is that when the New Testament church encountered stressors, something about this people, something about this community, something about this mission turned those stresses into incredible opportunities and wildly unpredictable successes. That when stresses came upon the church, it actually worked opposite of how the evil that was opposing them was intending for them to work. It's God's great theme of reversal. It's things that should have broken the church becoming actually what made the church what it was and made it so powerful. Do you believe that God can work through the stress that you have right now? Do you believe it intellectually, but is it in your heart so that when that stress starts hitting, you don't despair? I believe intellectually that God can work through stress, but when I experience stress, I just pray for God to get rid of it. I don't actually pray for him to work through it. Hey, God, work through the stress that I have right now. No, God, take it away. I don't want this anymore. Or I run the other way from it. This is human nature, but so far there have been uh, great scandals, there's been jailings, there's been beatings, there's been internal strife, there's been lying amongst the body, there's been a, uh, a, a, a catastrophe and a controversy that could have split the church that we talked about two weeks ago, but there is something that just keeps turning these murmurings into messes and powerful messages. And I believe that it's important for us to look at how the early church managed and responded to stress and made the kingdom this unstoppable, powerful force. This is worth asking ourselves to examine very closely, like we did two weeks, weeks ago, what does stress produce in us? And that's really challenging because today, the stakes actually get elevated in chapter seven. Anyone ever heard the phrase, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? And we like to remember that in certain seasons of life and at other times it escapes us, but what happens when it actually does kill you? What's the point then? What's the purpose behind this? 
You know, stresses in the early church in Acts chapter 7 escalate beyond what they previously experienced. Someone actually dies. They're actually killed for their faith in broad daylight, laid out in the street, and hit with rocks like a common dog. Actually, what we see in Acts chapter 7 can't really just be called a stressor. It goes beyond a stressor. It's full-blown suffering. It's trauma. And we admittedly don't do very well with stress these days. We might be the least equipped society in the history of the world to actually deal with stress and suffering. That's another sermon for another time. But we need to see what happens today to this man, Stephen, who we just met a couple of weeks ago. It's incredibly important for us to see what he actually saw in the midst of this stress and this suffering and this trauma, because if we do, how we process, endure, and respond to suffering has the ability to produce in us exactly what it produced in Stephen, and that is a seed of unstoppable power. And it was the hallmark and the calling card of the New Testament church that changed the world. So Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 53, you think we can do it? Guys, we're already six minutes in. You think we got, we got a shot? Is it a hostage situation yet? <laughs> Good. Oh, no, how are we going to do this? I'm sorry. Some of the murmurs that come to me are, hey, we really like listening to you preach, but you go really fast. Can you slow down? <laughs> Today, not that day. <laughs> it's not that day. <laughs> I want you to have Acts chapter 7 open. I want you to be looking at the text that was just read. That is what we're going to walk through at a high level view, and we're going to drill down for the places and points that we want to dwell on a little bit today. Stephen, if you remember, was one of the first deacons, if you want to call him that, appointed by the church in the midst of that great struggle and controversy over the food distribution where widows were being left out, and he was part of the solution that fixed that problem, but we also know that he began to speak, and he began to preach and minister, and he was so effective in his ministry that nobody could say anything to him. When Stephen spoke, he said things that people could not refute with logic. They couldn't even argue emotionally against him. They just kind of had to sit there and take it. And I know that there's nothing more frustrating than when someone is telling you the truth and you know they're right and you got nothing to say to them, so you just have to sit and let it wash over you. And this is the circumstance every time Stephen gets up to speak. He's so effective that it gets him arrested and hauled in before the Sanhedrin to answer these trumped up charges that they're making against him. And that's where we begin to look at our text today. Now back in chapter 6, which should just be one page over or right there with you in verses 13 and 14, it says, this guy speaks against the temple and the law. As a matter of fact, it says he never ceases in chapter 7 when they bring him before the Sanhedrin. He says, because of Jesus, we don't need the temple anymore, and we don't need the law anymore. Now, there's a little bit of truth in what they're saying, but like C.S. Lewis says, with a little bit of truth, they made the lie that much more convincing. So he's in a kangaroo court, just like Jesus was of sorts. And we pick up this narrative in chapter 7, verse 1, where it says, are these things true? Are these things so? And Stephen goes on to respond with what is the longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts, and that is actually worth pointing out because it's really strange for it to be found here. And it's something that I'm going to come back to in a few minutes, but I just want you to put a pen in it and know that it's incredibly thorough and detailed. It's really worth noting why this is. But his speech answers the two questions or the two charges they're bringing against him, and then he gives them a little bit of extra sauce just for good measure. So Stephen sets out and basically summarizes, if you just look at the high view of Acts chapter 7 here, verses 1 through 53, he summarizes in this chapter the entirety of the Hebrew scriptures up to that point, their entire history. Nothing makes someone matter than when you go back and you point out to them all the stuff they did in the past and how it's in conflict with who they're claiming to be right now. So he goes and he scandalously points out something that enrages the council, and I think if we're being honest, it might enrage us too, because there's lots of applications here, and this is not just an object or character lesson to say we should just be like Stephen. I think that Stephen has some stuff to say to us, and I think there are some ways that we ought to be modeling ourselves after Stephen as well, but he says to them, Abraham met God, and he didn't have a temple. He says, Moses met God in the burning bush where there was no temple. He said, God was with Joseph in Egypt, and there were a lot of temples, but not this one. 
And he said, even after the temple was built, Isaiah, who we talked about a month ago, met God face to face, and he wrote in his writings, and he prophesied that God does not dwell in a house made with hands. So he goes through and he says essentially, no, we don't need the temple to have God. That's one of the most scandalous things you could ever say to a Jew. They're in trouble from the annals of history, way back, putting their love and affection and identity and intention all into this temple, thinking that it was the thing that would protect them and the thing that gave them favor. Now you might be saying, that seems really obvious. Of course, he pointed out these things that are widely known to us and widely known to them. This is the Sanhedrin. They know their history. He's pointing out things they already believe. How could they become so fiercely protective of this building? That is just silly. Why would you kill somebody over this building, the temple? And there's no way I would have missed what they have missed. Lord, thank you so much that we're so much more enlightened than these silly Pharisees. And I might caution you, friends and myself, that yeah, these Jews place way too much of their identity and their emphasis and too much of their faith in this physical temple and they stumbled often in the history of their people because of it. But at least that temple and the system of worship that was ordained therein was something that was instituted and commanded and inhabited for most of their history by the God of the universe. At least it was a practice that he told them to be involved in. And yet Western Christianity and churches all across the country who know and believe that God does not dwell in temples made with hands, who know that the Spirit of God indwells each person individually and not a space or a sanctuary, who are so much wiser concerning the things of God than these Jews, often split and fight and leave and defame each other and backbite each other over what carpets are going to be in a building that we didn't even get commanded by God to have. Before we look at this text and say, these silly Jews in this crazy Sanhedrin, how could they get so worked up about this temple and this place of worship? I would say we should approach with some humility because people forever and people continue to be wanting to put extra significance in the places where they meet God. And we wrestle with it even today. But what Stephen is saying to these Jews is that it was never going to a place that made it special or significant. He's saying that any space that is inhabited by God is a special place. We've never needed a special place to meet God because wherever someone meets God is the special place. So now Stephen is saying something that creates a larger problem for them. Because it's not just that they really like their temple and they don't want that to be blasphemed. It's that the temple is the house where the sacrifices take place. And if Stephen is saying, we don't really need the temple to meet God, then what does that mean for the sacrifices? And this is why they say that Stephen is speaking against the law. Because what happens when we don't keep the law and we don't have a place to go and let the sacrifices cover up our problems if we don't need the temple? So he actually does create a really big problem for them. And he addresses this by going through what amounts to the history of the entire people once again. And in verse 39 of chapter 7, he says, under Moses, we didn't obey the law. And in verse 40, he says, under Aaron, we didn't obey the law. And in verses 42 and 43, he says, even our own prophets like Amos have said, we have never kept the law. So Stephen says, yeah. We have a problem with the law. We need the law. The law in and of itself is good and necessary. But the problem is we've never obeyed the law and we will never be able to obey the law. And if we're actually saved by obeying the law in this temple and in this place, then we got a really big problem because our ancestors didn't do it. We're not doing it and we're not going to be able to do it. So in retelling the own Slide system engage. Oh, we are good. Okay. <laughs> Stephen says, no, we don't need the temple to meet God. Second, yes, we need the law, but we can't keep it. And he notices something that's a common thread in the history of this people, something that he wasn't asked about, but something that he decides to give them anyway that brings this thing all up into uh, a conclusion and a climax. He gives them the answer underneath of the answer, if you will, the thing that they're not looking for when they get way more than they bargained for in his response. And that happens in verses 51 and 52 when he says, you stiff-necked people, 
Uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one. So he says, it's a pattern in our people that every time God sends a deliverer, the deliverer is rejected and persecuted by the very people they came to save. It happened to Moses. It happened to Joseph. David spent vast swaths of his life running in the wilderness from Saul. He also spent vast swaths running in the wilderness from his own children. Always persecuted. It happens every time God sends a deliverer. And this is how he brings his speech home. You stick neff people. You have a spiritually hard heart. You do all these rituals. You're concerned about this temple. You're concerned about all of these traditions and compliance, but your hearts are filled with fear and your hearts are filled with pride and cruelty. And the way you are doing things is not working. It is never going to work. You are never going to get there. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. And verse 53, you who received the laws as delivered by angels and did not keep it. He essentially says, you are just like them. We good? Okay. I did a little double duty there for a second. You're just like them. Why do you think this would enrage them so? Does someone have to die just because he points out the truth about the past? Actually, is there ever a moment in your life where someone says you're just like them that you've received that positively? Well, let's do an experiment since I'm the one in trouble today. Husbands, look at your wives and say, you're just like your mother. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I don't know. Don't shoot the messenger. I just... I have a gut instinct that that's not going to go well. And wives, if you say that to your husbands, they're probably not going to react. They're going to be like, yeah, whatever. But then six hours later, he's going to be in the shower. He's going to be like, my father is a brilliant man. So be mad about it. It's just a delayed response. We both hate it. That's why there's commercials and jokes about us becoming our parents. And here Stephen is saying, you guys are just like the ones who you believe you have come to be better and more enlightened than. Stephen tells them the root of the problem and the answer at the same time. The problem is that they need to be born again. And the answer is the righteous one, Jesus, who they, like their fathers, have now also killed. Stephen says we need the law, but we can't do it. None of us can. And the righteous one is the answer. It's not really very common for Jesus to be called the righteous one, but it makes sense in this context because he's talking about the law. And Jesus is the one who fulfilled the law. Righteousness in scripture is very synonymous with justice. This need to be justified. And the Jewish problem of trying to be justified by the law and falling short, Jesus is the one who lived the life that they couldn't live, that we can't live, and was justified. The righteous one. He's the one at which all of this is bound together and becomes complete. So, the climax of this pattern of saviors being rejected and killed, Moses, Joseph, David, Uh, Another minister once said that they all delivered their people in spite of suffering and rejection, but Jesus Christ delivered his people through suffering and rejection. And through that, he fulfilled the law, which either had to be obeyed or paid. And since we couldn't obey it, he paid it. He fulfilled it. He is the righteousness of a perfect life. He paid the debt in rejection and in suffering, he took the penalty that we deserve so that he, as the righteous one, becomes our righteousness. He is the final temple. He is the final sacrifice. He fulfilled the law. At this preaching, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. And he, full of the Holy Spirit, the scripture says, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. God, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him and they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. 
Stephen changed the world in what was maybe one of the shortest preaching careers of all time. He did it by what he has said to them, yes, but not only by what he said to them. Because this text also tells us that it's how Stephen carried himself in this stress, in this suffering, in these allegations, and this trauma, and especially that how he suffered is what created such a lasting impact. Can that be said of me? It's not what he said that really made the impact. It's what he suffered and how he endured and how he persevered. Can that be said of us? It's not what they say. They got a guy that preaches way too long, but it's how they are, especially in moments of suffering, especially in moments of duress, especially when under stress, that I cannot ignore the presence of God there. You see, in chapter 6, Luke tells us that when Stephen was speaking and facing these accusations, he had the face of an angel. Anyone got really mad and had the face of an angel while they were mad? There's usually two faces. It's a really scrunched up, angry red face with that vein popping out. Some of y'all have that. And then there's like the dull, no emotion, about to blow up, you should probably run face. But the face of an angel? Under these accusations, he wasn't enraged at the injustice. Under these accusations, he wasn't trembling and afraid for his life. He's incredibly bold, telling the people that had the power to kill him, you always resist the Holy Spirit, unflinching in the face of this stress. And as he's being killed, he's actually praying for the people who are killing him. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. But before that, he said, do not hold this sin against them. When I am wronged, I don't know if that's the prayer that I have. (laughs) It's not what I usually say. He's actually praying for the people they are killing him. And I would submit to you that they had never, we have never seen somebody die like this. We have never seen somebody in suffering and trauma like this handle themselves in a way that the weight of it cuts so deeply that it actually changes the world. I'm going to talk about how that happened as we close this morning. But before, I just want to say, what is it that allowed Stephen to be like this, to suffer like this? Like, What's the secret? How do you endure something like this with the face of an angel. It's not just what he knew, but it's what he saw. Here's what Luke tells us. Luke tells us in verse 54, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. He knew he was gonna die, but he full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. Now the right hand of God tells us that this is the image of the throne room of God. And if you're not in a Western democracy, the throne room is actually the courtroom because it's the king that presides over cases and the king that dispenses is justice and he hears what's going on. So he sees the throne room of God and in that throne room he sees Jesus not seated at the right hand of God finished with the work of salvation which is how he's usually pictured but instead standing at the right hand of God. That means that Jesus is doing something. Who stands before the bench? Jesus is speaking for Stephen in the throne room at that very moment. What Luke is telling us that as Stephen was being condemned on earth in a court, he was being commended in heaven in the court that actually matters. He was able to handle himself this way because when he was having accusations hurled upon him and stones hurled at him, he saw Jesus speaking up for him when there was no one else to speak for him. And if you see that, and if you know that, not just here, but here, there is no suffering that can come your way. There is no stress that can come your way. There is no trauma that can come your way that can take that peace away. 
You see, the scripture says that Stephen fell asleep. When I think of someone being bludgeoned with stones, I don't think of it as drifting off to sleep with a peace that passes all understanding. He was not in angst. He went to sleep with forgiveness and sympathy and empathy and grace and mercy in his heart, not even wanting the same to be done to them that was being done to him. This is all that Jesus is by the throne making an appeal and arguing for Stephen and being the advocate that John writes about in John 1 in 1 John 2 and 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. Or in Hebrews chapter 7 where it says, Jesus Christ ever lives to intercede for us. Stephen is seeing a vision in his heart of what he already knew in his head. Here's my question. To a much lesser extent, are you able to take what you know in your head and feel it and have it in your heart when stress and suffering comes your way? Do you actually believe when somebody wrongfully accuses you that even though you don't have an advocate that can make things right right here, that Jesus is standing at the right hand of the Father on your side, speaking for you, arguing for you, the righteous one? When you're in Christ Jesus and you're in that courtroom, what does your heavenly Father see And what do you see? I would submit to you that Stephen saw the only court that matters. There was no one on earth speaking up for him, but Jesus was. The reason why he was able to face what he faced the way he faced it and have the face of an angel and fall asleep in peace and power that passes understanding. And the reason why his suffering would become an explosive seed that would change the world is because he knew this fact and he didn't just know it with his head. The Holy Spirit helped him know it in his heart in the moment. So you could say this, to the level which you understand and know how much God loves you and delights in you, that Jesus is unashamed of you and that he intercedes for you and that he is now presently willing willing and able and ready to stand and advocate and argue for you, that is the extent to which you will be able to face, endure, and overcome any suffering that could ever befall you in this place. That's the secret. Nobody can say or do anything to you. No one can touch you when you know that Jesus has you. But family, is that what you see? Is that what you feel? Is that what you know? Okay, let's land this plane and let the hostages go. You ready? Okay. I've been hinting. I just saw so many looks of relief. (sighs) This is one of my favorite story within the story moments in the scripture. Let's think. Why is this such a long and detailed speech? Where would Luke have gotten this from? Luke says in the beginning of the book of Acts that he carefully and meticulously sources eyewitness accounts to create a faithful rendering of the things that have actually taken place. So, who would have given him this account in such detail, in such length, with such specificity? Luke is very careful to tell us that there was a young man there for the first time that we see him emerge in the history of the church. A young man named Saul. In verses 54 through 58, he's part of the mob that full-on consented to his murder. And what is actually kind of incredible about the study of Acts, as we're going to see as we go along, is that from this point forward, he becomes the main fixture of the narrative. It kind of goes from following Peter and the rest of the apostles, the church in Jerusalem, to predominantly following the journey of not just conversion, but faith and ministry of this young man who was holding the coats of the killers. The only possible explanation is that Saul is probably the source of this account. He's probably the one that talked to Luke about this. And that means what just happened here cut him. It impacted him so deeply like nothing before. It went so deep into his heart that he was able to recall it with such specificity, with such detail, with such emotion, down to quotes and the way that people looked in the courtroom, which is something that doesn't happen very often in Scripture either. Some commentators will point out that all of the themes of Paul's ministry through the epistles are all presented by Stephen, and Paul just develops them with much more power and more profound understanding. 
It goes on to change the world. You know, Stephen's speech and suffering changed the world, the story underneath the story, the seed, as it were, of that suffering would change Saul into Paul, not right away, but it would. And in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, On that day arose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Now, Jesus had told the apostles they were going to be his witnesses to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, but so far, nobody left Jerusalem. The movement wasn't going anywhere. Stephen's death forces them to leave and go into the surrounding areas. Stephen's death leads to an explosion of resurrection life and growth in the kingdom. The spread of the gospel to all nations happens because of what happened to Stephen. Stephen's suffering led to God's glory, just like Jesus' suffering led to God's glory. And when suffering comes on you, or when it comes on me, or it comes on us, we've got to know how to look where Stephen looked. Because if we can see what Stephen saw, then suffering, even ours, will produce the glory of God too. It's an unstoppable seed. And God will never let waste what he allows to happen. Church, I want to pray with you just a second. I want want us to marinate in this, and then we're going to have an invitation song. But I want you to think deeply about what you see when suffering comes upon you. Father, we just want to ask you right now to disarm us. Father, this is a, this is a hard saying. This is, this is convicting. Lord, we want to thank you for the example of Stephen. We want to thank you for the way that you work messes into messages. We want to be thankful for the way that you work stresses into successes. We want to thank you for the way that you even work suffering for your glory. And so, Father, whatever we are facing in this body right now, individually or collectively, Lord God, we want your name to be glorified. Give us the perspective and the ability to look into heaven and see Jesus at your right hand, just as Stephen saw Jesus at your right hand. Help us not to just know it with our heads, but to understand it in our hearts. Make it real to us, Lord God, so that when suffering comes, Maybe we won't have the face of an angel, but we'll have the words that we need. (laughs) And maybe, just maybe, what we go through will be the seed for your glory moving forward. Father, help us in this. Thank you for being ours, and thank you for Jesus being the righteous one. In his name we pray, amen. Someone in here is suffering today and you're suffering silently and you feel like there is nobody there to speak for you. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus died for you and if you accept him, he will ever live to intercede for you and to advocate for you and to fight for you and to argue for you. And if you have that, then nothing, nothing, no suffering, no trauma, nothing that can be thrown at you can stop what God wants to do with your life. And that is a beautiful, powerful thing. If we can help you in any way, know that our shepherds are at the back ready to pray, or you can come forward.